I had to resist last week. I had to resist last week when you talked about the song dynasty and say the dynasty didn't have a song in their heart. He's very funny. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we're talking about the last of the three great monsters of the 20th century, Mao Zedong. Uh, but of course, I have to uh, uh, come up with something that I forgot last week. And uh, how in the world could I have left something out of 3,000 years of Chinese history in an hour and 20 minutes? But uh, So there's a couple of things. Uh, that came to mind. Uh, I had talked about the examination system, very elaborate, that uh, for these thousand years or so um, was being used uh, in China. And at its height, as it developed, um, it was so extensive that those who were taking the exam after years of study, they would be put into a room almost like a prison cell, and they were kept there for three days. That was the amount of time it took to complete the exam, oh, three days. So yeah, it was extensive, and most people did not pass uh, after that. Uh, but the ones who did pass, uh, they were the cream of the crop, very intelligent, uh, hardworking people. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was kind of interesting. In the dealings with the British in the 1800s, uh, the British, um, as we know, as I had mentioned, uh, pushing their opium onto the Chinese and making sure that the Chinese uh, kept their ports open so that they could sell illegally the opium. After the Second Opium War, uh, one of the provisions in the treaty was that the British uh, no longer wanted to be called barbarians <laughs> because the Chinese, in the Chinese mind, there were two kinds of people. There were the Chinese and there were the barbarians. Everybody was a barbarian if you were not Chinese. And in the official documents uh, at, that China would draw up, for any purpose, when it mentioned the British, they were the barbarians. And so in this treaty, the British said, you know what, I think we've had enough of this barbarian stuff. We are not barbarians. We may do terrible things sometimes, but we're not barbarians. So you will refer to us uh, with some other Chinese character, not barbarians. Mm -hmm. So well, that's still the way in Japan. Yeah. Is it really? Everybody's barbarian, huh? They, they, I don't know whether it's barbarian or not, but they have a word that means you're not Japanese. Uh huh. So it's the Japanese and everybody else. Yeah, and it's derogatory. I don't know oh, really? the word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not like Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Like everybody else. Well, that's where barbarous just means foreigner. Yeah, but it has a derogatory. Mm -hmm. It has come. Yeah, derogatory meanings to it. Okay, Mao Zedong. Look at that kindly man with the gentle eyes. Who would have known uh, what a monster he was? So, bibliography. I have never, in all of the biographical lectures that I've done, and I've done quite a few for those of you who know, uh, who have attended my lectures, um, I have never come across so many biographies that had so many different viewpoints of a single character than Mao Zedong. You'd think it would be fairly straightforward. The guy was a horrific uh, character. And yet, there are facets to his personality that can be a bit confusing. And so um, I'm gonna go through these and it's, I, I'm going to try to think of the individual take that each of these authors had. This first one is for uh, middle school kids. It's uh, Mao Zedong. It's a series on great military leaders, which he was. Um, 
And so it's 116 pages, very easy read for middle school kids. Um, I'm not really sure how I felt about this because uh, she does bring out the horrible things that he does on the one hand. On the other hand, she kind of plays down other things uh, like the, the cult of Mao and passes it off as something, well, you know, it's inevitable that such a thing was going to happen. I'm thinking, yeah, that's not inevitable. Mm -hmm. That was something that was very pointedly uh, created by Mao and his followers. And the other thing, um, something that a number of people do today um, in our current climate with China is so as not to denigrate this leader that they hold so highly even today, um, you, you conclude your work with something along the lines of, um, yeah, he did some terrible things, but you know, it was kind of necessary to have a really strong leader to get China united as he did. And um, I think that's unconscionable for the tens of millions of people that were unnecessarily uh, killed for that. It, it just, no, you did not need Mao Zedong. Uh, the next one, Jonathan Spence. Um, this one is for adults. Nice and short biography. I like these, usually. Sure. Um, a nice short biography, um, and it's for adults, 188 pages. Um, Again, this one, um, he, in his introduction, he talks about how uh, awful Mao was and his personality quirks and things like that. Um, but as you read through it, sometimes you don't get the real feel of how awful he was. And that kind of, uh, kind of bothered me a little bit um, because when you mention horrific murders, and people starving to death uh, for no good reason. And you don't have any real feeling into it as a writer. Um, it just kind of hits me wrong because this is horrific things that are happening. Um, the next one is a fantastic book. Dr. Li Zhu, if I can get this right. Zhi Shui, maybe. The Private Life of Chairman Mao, um, 682 pages. This was his personal doctor, his personal physician, who was with him uh, from 1955 or so to the end of his life. He was a young man in 1955, and he came on the staff, and he spent uh, time with Mao almost exclusively uh, for that many years and was with him almost all the time. Uh, he would go back and forth. He complained about, you know, he had a wife and a family, uh, but Mao came first. And when Mao traveled, he traveled with him. And so he got a, a, a great insight into the day-to-day -day life of Mao. Great read. It's amazing work. The next one, Zhong Chang and John Halliday. <coughs> Mao, the unknown story. This one, more than all of the others, I'm not really sure how to feel about. Um, because this one, I mean, I know how, what a monster he was, and everybody recognizes this. In this book, he comes off as even a greater monster than I would have imagined, but more, more than that, it came off as some, um, supervillain who knew how to manipulate people even beyond what an ordinary people, an ordinary person uh, would know. Like he was, every decision that he made, every uh, person that he interacted with, it was always with evil intentions. And, and for me it's like, it went a bit beyond what I would believe in what is possible in a person. Yeah, he was evil, but did he really have that sort of genius 
to manipulate everybody around him and so that he could go through all of the ordeals that he went through to become the dictator of China and, and ruin everybody else's life along the way. So for me, it was, yeah, he was evil, but he was not, I don't believe he was that much of a genius to be able to manipulate people the way they say he did. Now, this next one, Philip Short, Mao, A Life. This one, if you want a really good in-depth uh, biography of Mao, this is the one. Uh, back in 1999, 782 pages. Very scholarly, uh, very professional, a good read. Not dry, um, but uh, yeah, this is probably the most professional of the uh, books that I've read here. Uh, this next one, Harrison Salisbury, The New Emperors, China in the Era of Mao and Deng. So this covers not just Mao Zedong, but uh, his successor, Deng Xiaoping. And so this one, I, I liked it and I didn't like it, but more for the style than the substance. Um, he tends to meander as he writes. So he's on one topic and he jumps off into another topic when you don't even realize what he's doing. And he goes in a direction um, that you wouldn't have expected and you're not really sure why. So it gives a lot of really good insights, well written as far as the information goes. Uh, but uh, for my taste, he just jumps from one topic to another without a really good reason to. And this last one, Barbara Tuchman, one of my favorite historians. Yeah. How many of you have ever read Barbara Tuchman? Mm -hmm. I would read anything that she writes uh -huh. because she's just a great uh, writer, very great insights into what she's writing about. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting little work. This isn't really about Mao per se, but back in 1972, when, as we all know what happened in 1972, right? In China, who took a trip to China? Nixon. Richard Nixon took, went there, and he went with a lot of journalists and writers who came along with him. And Barbara Tuchman went, and she wrote about her experiences. And she says that um, she was allowed to travel freely. She was not followed by any secret uh, police, and she could decide where she wanted to go and she found that China was not as awful a place as she had heard it was because of the cultural revolution that was going on at the time. So very interesting take about this. And when we get to the cultural revolution, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, I'm gonna go very quickly through the early years of Mao. Born December 26, 1893 in the village of Shaoshan. Uh, parents were farmers, as almost all Chinese were at the time. Um, he got to go to school from age 8 to 13. He had an arranged marriage uh, at the age of 14, uh, but was a widower at 17. Um, and you'll get different people will give different takes on this uh, because Mao himself was not entirely clear what this was about because some will say that um, Mao had nothing to do with her, didn't want her, didn't want to be married to her, uh, but he was forced to, and so, but he never spent any time with her, never consummated the marriage, so, and others will just say he was married for uh, this amount of time, and he was a widower. Um, as a teenager, he read uh, this rather short book, Words of Warning to an Affluent Age. And this was written by a Chinese man warning China um, that we're in trouble. The rest of the world, or at least the Western world, is so far ahead of us in technology and in, in so many other ways that we need to do something about it uh, and quickly, otherwise we will just be another colony of the Western <clears throat> Europeans. 
And that kind of really shocked him, as it did many Chinese at the time. Um, he went to college for five years, 1913 to 1918. This, at this time, um, the, uh, the empire had fallen in the sense that there were no longer any emperors. Uh, they were trying, Sun Yat-sen, as I mentioned last week, um, had helped to overthrow that whole imperial system. And now we were going through a time uh, called the Warlord Era. I have that down at the very bottom here. From 1916 to 1928, China was not a unified country. The various districts were run almost independently uh, by various warlords and uh, were not, and it was, it was a pretty awful time. So, um, and a, a little bit later, uh, Mao joins the, the new communist movement, 1921. He was one of the charter members of this, uh, the CCP, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, he was a labor organizer, something that he did very well. Uh, propaganda was his uh, forte. He knew how to push uh, the communist agenda and make it look appealing. There was also the Nationalist Party uh, run by Sun Yat-sen that was somewhat socialist, but not communist, not allied with Soviet Russia. Uh, which the Communist Party, the uh, Chinese Communist Party was. Um, they united in 1923 in order to um, try to get China united because there's so much chaos, so much trouble between the various factions that they thought if they, the two biggest parties could get together, uh, they could unite China. Um, the problem, of course, is they just couldn't get along. Uh, Mao was militarizing the peasants and uh, leading in various labor uprisings. And so, oh, one of the issues that Mao had that was an ongoing issue for several years was that Mao, being a peasant himself, being raised as a peasant, uh, wanted to lead the peasants in this communist uh, revolt, this communist revolution. But of course, if you know your Marx, you know that Marx was not in favor of leading the peasants to a communist revolution. It's the, the inner cities, the industrial proletariat. Only an industrialized country is supposed to turn communist. And so that was the push from Soviet Russia and the communists in China was that, no, we don't lead peasants. They're, <coughs> they don't matter. It's the industrial factory workers that we lead to this communist utopia. But uh, as Mao knew, it, we didn't have a whole lot of uh, industrial proletariat in China because there wasn't a lot of industry, but they did have a lot of peasants. So, as it was, as was inevitable, uh, the two sides uh, broke up, and uh, Sun Yat-sen, by the way, dies at, in 1925, and a new leader comes out, uh, Chiang Kai-shek. He's now leading the nationals, and he realizes that the communists are, uh, are getting a little too militant, and they cannot be trusted. So. Uh, 1927, uh, Chiang orders the communists to be arrested, many of them executed in all the major cities. And um, Mao tried to lead uh, a small revolt against this, was easily defeated. So uh, the nationalists were the ones who united, ultimately who united China behind Chiang Kai-shek. And um, and the communists uh, then retreat to the countryside, which suited Mao pretty well. There's Chiang Kai-shek, very tragic figure, Chiang Kai-shek. That was uh, America's great hope for China. It didn't work out. 
But Mao, back in the, his, uh, back in the countryside with the peasants, um, he sets up his base of operations and starts training his men. He's going to create this new uh, communist utopia wherever he uh, happened to be. And he organized and he, he taught. He made sure that everybody was politicized. We have enemies. We are the people. And the, uh, the enemies that we have must be uh, fought against. And that is really uh, the genius of Mao is that he knew how to uh, organize, he knew how to keep people focused, and um, made sure that everybody was well indoctrinated with uh, communist ideology. Um, in his army, he removes all designations of rank. We are all equal in the communist utopia. Nobody is above anybody else. And so there are no marks of uh, superiority, officers, sergeants, anything like that. We are all equal soldiers. And, uh, and again, his emphasis was, we are going to win over the peasants. And the way we're going to do this is through land reform. There's been a, a long standing tensions between large landowners and the more poor peasants a lot of resentments, and periodically through Chinese history, as I had mentioned last week, uh, there were peasant revolts because they couldn't take any more the, the large landowners abusing them. And so Mao plays on this. Um, and he, in the areas that he occupied, he would redistribute the land. He would take away the uh, large land holdings from the large landowners and um, distributed amongst the peasants. And that was a fairly popular thing to do. We come to the great uh, long march. Um, one of the uh, truly harrowing ordeals that any military has ever gone through in history. Um, they'll say over and over again, this is unparalleled in history, and I'm not sure that it's unparalleled, but it ranks up there with one of the greatest uh, ordeals that any military has had to go through. Um, Chiang Kai-shek was going to stamp out uh, the last of the communists, and, um, and Mao was leading it. Mao was a very, very intelligent man when it came to guerrilla warfare. That was his expertise. And so when Chang surrounded him with superior forces, uh, superior equipment, and went after him, uh, Mao would retreat, go up into the hills, and find pockets of uh, the nationalist forces. You retreat, you retreat, you retreat, and then you find small outposts. You find a thousand men here, three thousand men there. You surround them with your superior forces and you wipe them out. Or you turn them to, uh, to your side. And he was good at doing both. And uh, twice, Chang went after him with superior forces chased him through the wilderness, out into the mountains, and twice, even though Chang had superior forces, he was defeated, humiliated by this small band of communists. The third time, Chang wasn't going to uh, let those things happen again. He let his men know, we're not going to chase him in small groups. When they uh, are, are retreating, we're not gonna be ambushed. And so he had 800,000 men surrounding 87,000 men. And so Mao realized that uh, he needed to get out of there. So he did escape in the night with his 87,000 men. One of the problems that Chang had throughout his, his uh, reign as leader of China uh, was that uh, he was 
He was not the greatest administrator. He was a leader that people looked to as the only alternative to Mao. Uh, but the, uh, the generals that he had under him uh, were often very either inept or corrupt along with the, the lower uh, echelons. And so they could be bribed. They were often lazy. Uh, they didn't do their jobs oftentimes. And so uh, time and time again, Mao, with his very well-disciplined troops, uh, could outsmart them or bribe them, or he had spies uh, in amongst them so that he knew what was going on. And he escaped. And he marches over a period of a little over a year, 6,000 miles, through uh, some of the most harrowing uh, expanse of China, the mountains, the deserts, the swamps, the worst of it. All the, and during some of that time, of course, he's being attacked by uh, Chiang Kai-shek's forces, sometimes strafed from the air, uh, sometimes um, at various mountain passes. Uh, there's a lot of folklore about this long march uh, some of which could be believed, uh, some of which uh, cannot be believed. The trouble is, uh, when you're listening to communists tell of their great tales of uh, this march, uh, you know that you cannot trust that it's going to be accurate. But uh, just the fact alone that they went through these territories uh, in this year-long march, uh, that in and of itself was an incredible feat. Of course, at the end of the march, instead of 87,000 men, he had a little under 6,000. That's how many men he lost in this year-long ordeal. What was the purpose of the long march? He's getting away from Chiang Kai-shek. Um, now, he was not the only, this was not the only group of communists in China, but it was the main one. He did, at the end, hook up with uh, another group of communists up in the mountains up north. And, um, and eventually Chang, the problems that Chang had was that not only was he fighting the communists, uh, this, at this time, the Japanese were now invading China. And so he had to prioritize his troops. And he prioritized Mao. He wanted to get Mao. Uh, of course, he had problems with the, the local warlords in every district too. He had united China, but it was not well united. The warlords still wanted their piece of independence, uh, even though they recognized uh, Chiang Kai-shek as the leader. So it was a difficult ordeal for Chiang Kai-shek. And um, it's just a crying shame that he was not a better leader than he was. And here's Mao Zedong on the long march. You notice he's the only one on the horse. Um, one of the things that some will bring out was that uh, Mao did not march. He was either carried, because when the, when the long march started, he was deathly ill. He had pneumonia or something. and. Um, and so he was carried for a long part of it. And here he is on the horse. Uh, he, and some will say he never took a step except to get off the horse or to be carried. Um, so, but it was a, a horrific ordeal. But with the Japanese attacking now, uh, they became even a, a greater threat than the communists. And so Chiang Kai-shek uh, decided uh, that he would unite with Mao to fight against the Japanese. Uh, Mao, for the most part, uh, and this is another disputed thing, did the communists uh, even fight the Japanese very much during this time? 1937 to the end of World War II um, was the time of very intense fighting uh, against the Japanese in China. And um, some will say that the communists did very little. They did a few uh, guerrilla runs 
uh, raids on small outposts and things like that, but never really seriously uh, attacked the Japanese the way uh, Chiang Kai-shek's forces were. And of course, uh, you could attribute this to Mao Zedong's uh, wiles of looking like we are attacking, but we're really preserving our forces and trying to build our forces uh, while we have this respite of Chang not attacking us. And he built his forces tremendously. As I said before, Mao, uh, one of his great talents was propaganda. He could convince people of the rightness of his ways and the evils of the, the bourgeoisie and the capitalists and how we need to fight them because they are so evil and they're going to destroy us uh, with Chang at their head. So this is uh, one of the books that Mao writes at this time is on guerrilla warfare. And this is a classic. He knew what he was doing. And this is one of the, uh, uh, one of the main quotes from the book. When the enemy advances, we retreat. When the enemy rests, we harass. When the enemy tires, we attack. When the enemy withdraws, we pursue. Very cogent uh, strategy. Yeah, that's 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 what you do. <clears throat> and it is also at this time, uh, in the early 1940s, that Mao uh, really pushes his own cult. He has solidified his his position in the Communist Party, which was a bit shaky before the Long March. But afterwards, he becomes uh, the man that everybody looks to. What heroic things that he did with his men. And so uh, he makes sure that his writings, along with uh, Marx and Lenin and Stalin, are the ones that are authoritative, in, and especially his in China. And everybody must be devoted to Mao Zedong thought. And this is where he starts putting up his portraits. When he has occupied a particular city, he makes sure that his portrait is everywhere. And he starts his purges, making sure that people know that if you are lax, if you are critical, you can be purged. You could be arrested, you could be shot, you could be beaten up. Um, and he was, uh, like I said, again, the propaganda was just incredible. He was, that was really a great talent that he had. Um, one of the uh, things that he starts at this time um, to really get into the heads of his soldiers and his followers, uh, you have uh, discussion groups and you get together and it's almost like a religious meeting where you confess your sins to each other. Mm -hmm. And everybody is to confess their sins. Because everybody, as any good Christian will tell you, everybody has sinned. Mm -hmm. And in the communist religion, it's the same way. We have all sinned. And so we're going to get together and we will confess our sins in that way. You purge yourself of your evils, and you can be forgiven by the great god Mao. Also, Mao now has something on you. <laughs> Mao has something on everybody. Nobody can escape. If he doesn't like you, he can bring up what you said about your evils and uh, use it against you. And this was used time and time again through the rest of uh, his time as leader. And there he is, the great god, Mao Zedong, and everybody looking to him. And you'll notice the people, these are not all Chinese. These are the people of the world. Everybody in the world should look to Mao.
Now we come to the most, uh, I don't know if, it, if I should say interesting or confusing time uh, when Mao actually becomes the dictator, the leader of China. Uh, Mao, as I said, had built up his troops from a few tens of thousands to about a million through the end of World War II. And now that the Japanese have been defeated, he's going to use them. He's nominally still attached to the Nationalist Party, but everybody knows once the Japanese are done for, they're going to go at it again. Um, and of course, the Russians at the end of World War II were in northern China because they, as an agreement at Yalta, Stalin uh, promised to help out in defeating the Chinese I mean, defeating the Japanese in China. And so they did. They invaded northern China to help defeat the Japanese. They were also there to help Mao. And so the Russians are now helping Mao, and the United States is helping Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek. Initially, Chiang, when he went after Mao, was very successful and was on the verge of destroying Mao. Mao uh, was at his wit's end. He really thought that this was the end for him because Chang was going after him and, and closing in. And then the United States came and stopped it. Why? Yeah. <laughs> the reason being is because uh, Mao Zedong, very charming, very convincing in his lies. When US envoys come to talk to Mao, as many had during this time, during World War II, Mao was telling everybody, look, we're not really attached to Stalin or even communism. When we take charge, we're, we want to be democratic. We're not really into the horrible things that Stalin did. So you really don't have to worry about us. And he convinced them. So this was the new civil war. This is the end of World War II when everybody just wants to be done with war. The United States wanted China to stabilize. We didn't want a new civil war that would go on for years and years and look, Mao isn't that bad of a guy anyway. So we want you guys to get together and form a coalition government. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Chiang Kai-shek, if you don't, we will remove all of our aid from you. Mm -hmm. And so Chiang Kai-shek, having Mao on the ropes, had to stop. Mm -hmm. This is another curious thing that, depending on the history that you're reading, mm -hmm. will either bring that out as a very significant uh, part of the history, or it may leave it out entirely, mm -hmm. which is very curious to me, uh, because it is a very significant part. If we would have just let him, he, you know, you, you can't always tell what exactly would happen, but it really looked like uh, he could have crushed the communists and Mao Zedong. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't tell that at the time and Mao Zedong had totally hoodwinked us. And so, yeah, coalition government, that will work. So Mao got about four or five months of respite. And then Chiang Kai-shek said, you know what, I gotta get him now, otherwise I'm not going to be able to. And he is a dyed-in-the-wool communist, and so we're at it again. And so the United States, okay, okay. So. Uh, Chang went after him again, but it was too late. One of the things that Mao really needed, go up north, hook up with the Soviets, get some equipment, rest your men, organize, and then go at Chang. And that's what he did. One of the most remarkable defeats in history, I think, was this turn of events. Once Chiang Kai-shek lost that initiative, he lost the war. 
Chiang Kai-shek, as I said, uh, was not a great administrator. His generals very often were very corrupt and could turn. And so with Mao, well organized now, with his million man army, uh, went at it and one battle after another just totally destroyed uh, Chiang Kai-shek's army. So, just, yes. But if, but if, if, if Czech said no, I'm not Chiang Kai Shek said no, I'm going after him, and the US pulled their money, what would the outcome be? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. So, Chiang, at the time, Chiang felt it was important enough to hold back so that the United States would not. Yeah, I mean, either way, the outcome might have been the same. It's possible. You can never tell what would have happened. But it's one of those what ifs of history. Yeah. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, your first line says Mao with a million troops. Yeah. But he was, the, the, his problem was he didn't have them organized at the time. Chain got the jump on him. And organization is everything in the military. And he just, he wasn't prepared. He needed that four or five months to get his troops organized and and set on the right path of where they should all be attacking. And Chang got the jump on him, and um, and so it, it really looked as if uh, he was going to be defeated. That's hard to picture. China's so big, like it's hard for yeah. me to picture. Like, where are these right. guys? Right. <laughs> right. And how many of you are? Uh, yeah well have, have a good knowledge of the topography of, of China. I mean, they, they, there's a wide variety of landscapes. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but anyway, so now uh, Chang's forces crumble over a period of three years or so. And um, as I said, his, his generals were inept or corrupt or both. And, um, and they just fall apart. Um, Chang flees to Taiwan and becomes the ruler of Taiwan for the next several years. And, uh, and now Mao is ruling China, 1949. And his first, uh, his first priority is to get aid from the Soviet Union uh, within weeks of becoming the dictator of China. He travels, he makes a 10 day train trip to Moscow to seek aid from his, his ally, Joseph Stalin. And he was gonna be there on Stalin's birthday, have a great birthday present for Stalin, December 21st. Of course, Mao's birthday is pretty close there too. Um, and uh, Stalin has never liked Mao and has always treated him coldly. Uh, this is their first face-to-face -face meeting, but Mao knew that uh, Stalin has always been somewhat stingy towards him, uh, never really trusted him. Of course, Stalin never trusted anybody, uh, but- um, Was there a reason? Because he's Stalin. Was I mean, there a reason that Stalin didn't like him? Because he couldn't control him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it began with, look, I'm gonna lead the peasants not the oh, proletariat right. of the that's cities. Right. And um, so Mao had an independent mind and Stalin didn't like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so so they, they've already had a long history. And um, you know, so Mao knew that. So Mao went with his hat in hand, please could you help us out? After all, we're brothers, right? We're, uh, we're all communists here and um, Stalin, who is now the master of not only the Soviet Union, but Eastern Europe, mm. uh, has been distributing aid to many Eastern European countries. Mm. Uh, Poland got many millions of dollars, even more than he was willing to give China. Mm. And Poland is a very small country in comparison to China. Mm. So, um, so Mao was there for a couple of months and um, he was not, treated as a VIP. He was given a place to stay, 
here is your house with your attendants and um, you can keep your entourage and I'll get to you when I'm not busy. <laughs> and Mao was there day after day after day with no sign of anything from Stalin. And so finally Mao said, well look, if, you're, if we're not gonna do anything, I'm just gonna go <coughs> home. And at that point Stalin says, okay, we'll get together, we'll sign a treaty and you can go home. So uh, he's, giving, he's given a $300 million loan, not a grant, a loan. And it was to be paid back in grain from the Chinese harvests. And this will play out uh, very uh, tragically in the years ahead. Of course, Stalin um, being, uh, after uh, collectivizing all of his farms, is in great need of grain because of the communist uh, inept uh, ways of farming. And so, but he had to also, Mao had to give in some mineral rights and trading concessions. And here they are, don't they look happy? <laughs> look at that. Yeah, and you say, uh, Mao says, I am smiling. <laughs> And then we have the Korean War. The, uh, the North Koreans, uh, and I'm, I'm going to assume that you are familiar with the general outline of what was going on with the Korean War just in, in the interests of time. But um, uh, Mao, Stalin would, gave the green light. Yes, uh, go invade South Korea, unite the country under communist rule, uh, and Mao was okay with it too. At the time, President Truman had made statements to the effect that the United States had no interest either in Taiwan or South Korea, right up until the time that South Korea was invaded. And then all of a sudden Truman says, uh, no, maybe we do have some interest in South Korea. And, uh, and when we sent troops, Mao was actually pretty surprised. Um, but he was watching. Mao's, one of Mao's first priorities was to get Taiwan. He was organizing his troops and getting ready uh, for an invasion of Taiwan. And then uh, the invasion of South Korea by North Korea happened and he realized that he may have to get involved in this instead. So once uh, MacArthur came in and pushes the North Koreans back right up to the Chinese border, uh, Mao decided against the advice of his generals. His generals were very fearful of American power, as well they might be. We have air power. The Chinese have almost nothing. So Mao goes to Stalin again and says, look, can you give us some air cover? Help us out. Uh, we're comrades in arms. And Stalin very reluctantly said, yes, okay, I will give you some air cover. And then really didn't much. So, um, but what Mao did have are millions and millions of soldiers to uh, attack the Americans. So human waves of Chinese soldiers push back the Americans. And this is the type of thing where you have uh, hundreds of thousands of soldiers. The front line soldiers have the rifles. The, the echelons in the back pick up the rifles of the dead Chinese soldiers as they go, because there's not enough for everybody. But. Once you see somebody dead in front of you, you can go pick up that rifle. So uh, they have lots and lots of uh, soldiers to waste and they did waste them. So the Chinese pushes the uh, Americans back, Americans push back again, and the line winds up roughly where it was at the beginning, uh, the 38th parallel. And after two years of that stalemate, uh, once Eisenhower came into office and started suggesting that he's going to drop atomic weapons on them, uh, they decided that uh, an armistice should happen. 
And uh, roughly, and this is, this figure, 900,000 Chinese dead, is, is just an estimate. We have no idea of the exact numbers because, well, it's China. They're not about to give them out. Mm -hmm. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but what this did do was uh, put off indefinitely any plans that Mao had for invading Taiwan. This was the cream of the crop of his army that he just wasted. There's the Chinese in Korea. And by the way, um, Mao's, one of Mao's sons died in Korea as well. And uh, just to give you an idea of his feelings for really any human being, when he was told that his son had died, um, you might say he kind of took it hard, but his, his philosophical uh, ideas were basically, you know, he's just one man amongst many, and we just gotta move on. So he took it, kind of took it hard, but he got, he got past it quickly. So the results of the Korean War, Mao, uh, even though he lost an incredible amount of men, um, gained prestige in the communist world because he stood up to the great evil United States, the capitalist country uh, that everybody must hate if you're a good communist, and pushed them back. Um, China now has North Korea as their client state, and he's even more untouchable than he was before. Everybody uh, must recognize the greatness of Mao. And of course, uh, Stalin uh, comes off as a very, once again, a very stingy and unreliable partner. And as I said, can't invade Taiwan. Uh, he did have, uh, he had to face a lot of, uh, the Western world basically uh, embargoed him for some time after that. Now, as much as I, as reluctant as I am to say anything good about communists and Mao Zedong, there was one uh, program that actually was very helpful in China. This was the Patriotic Health Campaign. Mm -hmm. China, up to this point, had been very backwards uh, as far as hygiene goes. Uh, most of the country, as we know, was illiterate. Maybe 20% could read. And so in all these villages across China, they were almost completely ignorant of modern hygiene methods. And Mao was going to change that. So he put out, he, he would train people and they would get maybe three or four months of training, which was a lot more than anybody else had. Mm -hmm. And then they were called barefoot doctors and they would travel through the countryside to the various villages and train people and give informational uh, lectures about modern hygiene. You need to be clean. You need to be uh, implement safety measures when you're out working in the fields. Um, you should eradicate pests like flies and mosquitoes because they carry diseases, a thought that most Chinese just didn't know. Um, so, so with a few months of training, these barefoot doctors would go out and talk to uh, the various villages and inform them of some very basic hygiene practices that the rest of the world uh, already knew about. And it was remarkably successful in reducing disease amongst the populace. Uh, they had four major pests that they were to focus on. Three of them are very reasonable. The fourth was ridiculous. So flies, mosquitoes, rats, and sparrows were to be sought after and killed at every occasion. Sparrows. Do you know why you need to kill sparrows? Because sparrows eat your crops. And so sparrows must be eliminated. 
So here's some of the posters of, since most people couldn't read, they would give out these posters and kind of explain what they're about. Um, one of the interesting things that I haven't mentioned about China and the peasants, peasant farmers, um, when, uh, when you have a culture in which you have not a lot of draft animals, you don't have a lot of cows, like in Europe, you have lots of cows, you have lots of horses. You use that, you use uh, that as manure, right? They poop on the ground, you collect that, and you put that in your fields. That helps the crops grow. In China, you don't have a lot of cows and horses. You use your own, and that is what they did. It was a very valuable commodity, by the way, and they took it very seriously. They used their own feces as fertilizer in their crops. But anyway, so here's some posters that they use. These are flies, they carry diseases. You don't want them on your food. And then you have the sparrow campaign. How do you kill sparrows? Well, you get the kids to shoot slingshots at them. You go to the trees, you have, you bang your pots together, you wave these big flags. You do not let them rest on the trees. And if you chase them around long enough, they will fall dead from the sky. Really? And that's what they did. So you could shoot them, and they would parade them as trophies through the streets. So, yeah, you kill sparrows. Now, can anyone tell me what could go wrong if you kill all the sparrows? They don't. You don't have anything to eat the flies and the mosquitoes. It turns out that sparrows eat more than just rice. They eat the bugs that eat the rice. And so, yeah, that came back to haunt them. So Mao is in the process of remaking China. And this is, by the way, the, the Korean War is still going. This is still the early 50s, uh, 50 to 55 or so. And Mao is remaking China. He's going to go after all of the awful criminals that exist throughout all societies. He's going to eliminate the bandits, the spies, the bullies. Isn't that interesting? I'm, I'm sure it has a different connotation in Chin Chinese when you say somebody's a bully, uh, but I can't imagine going to every school and shooting all the bullies. <laughs> um, but so the bullies, the despots, the, the landowners, I think is what they really mean when they say despots. Um, and since the Korean War was going on, everybody's feeling very patriotic because there's nothing that unites a country like war. When you have an evil villain that everybody can focus on, that unites a country like nothing else. And so China was enthusiastic about Mao's plans and his uh, programs to improve China. So landlords and bureaucrats and bosses were often beaten in the streets. And this is a tactic that Mao, who didn't have a KGB like Stalin had, uh, he used ordinary people. He told the people, you rise up and kill your enemies or have them arrested, beat them through the streets, and they did. So people all across China are rising up and punishing their oppressors. And within the first few years, you have a um, little more than a million people who are killed or sent to various work camps. And then we have the 100 Flowers Movement. Uh, this came about 1957, uh, when things were starting to settle down a little bit, and Mao is saying, look, we can have people uh, give us feedback about how they feel about what a wonderful job we're doing. <laughs> now, people knew, at first, people were thinking, uh, is this some sort of trick? Because we know that people who criticize Mao are often arrested. But they were told, and Mao made sure that everybody knew, no, 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 we really want your input. 
If you have some criticism of what we're doing, we want to know about it. And so again, we're gonna have these discussion groups and you will say something. You are not going to let, we're not gonna let you off the hook. You're going to say something about how we're doing our job. And so once again, people being forced to will say, well, maybe this shouldn't have happened. Maybe you did this wrong. I don't like the way uh, this uh, person in, in charge of our village was brutally beating people, that sort of thing. And so Mao, and here's another uh, contentious point that different historians have different takes on. Did Mao do this purposely to bring out the uh, people who were criticizing him, or did he really believe that people were just going to have nice, soft criticisms that he could take? You can decide for yourselves. <laughs> but as it happens, once Mao saw the criticisms, he was outraged. Enough of this hundred flowers stuff. <laughs> we are going to crack down on you people who are criticizing the communist way. You must be uh, the rightists. You must be capitalists uh, for you to criticize in that manner. And so he quickly cracks down, uh, arrests hundreds of thousands of people, either uh, to be shot or to be uh, put on work camps. And this is, this is another part of it. Um, if you wanted to put out your criticisms publicly, they have these uh, discussion walls. It's like a, a community bulletin boards. And this was a, a tradition in China that went back you know, long before Mao. Uh, but uh, people would come, they'd post up their remarks about society, and people would come and read it. And it was a way for Mao to track down uh, his detractors. So I like this. This is what it was supposed to look like, the Hundred Flowers Movement. Look at this, all these people. <laughs> happily engaged in their personal business, doing uh, wonderful things and enjoying life. I like this guy back here. The, yeah. I'm not sure what that's supposed to be. Where's that wrong? Yeah. So this is how it's supposed to look, the Hundred Flowers Movement. But this is how it really looked. So here's Mao, let a thousand flowers bloom, and he's throwing out these seeds and then coming right behind him. Yeah, we'll take care of those hundred flowers. But we're just warming up. Mao now wants a great leap forward. He knows that they are way behind the West in industrialized production. So now we're going to focus on not just both farm production and industrial production. So the way you do that, just like the Soviets did, you collectivize the farms, and that had already started, but he's going to go uh, full in on this and, um, and uh, build factories at a great rate. So he does get some industrial experts from the Soviet Union to come and help out in building factories because uh, China was so woefully short of any kind of expert to uh, implement uh, those kinds of things. So, um, and one of, one of Mao's great ideas, of which he had many, <laughs> look how simple it is. If you want to produce more steel, more iron, you get everybody involved. So you build a backyard furnace for people all across China, thousands and thousands of them. Anybody can do it. How hard can it be, right? So what these peasants are doing, once they are told you will produce iron, you will produce steel in your backyard, where did they get the materials to do it? Well, you take your own pots and pans. You take your, your own farm implements because you gotta produce. So you melt down your own 
tools, mm -hmm. your pots and pans, because Mao needs his steel. And so what you do, in essence, is to take steel that is useful. You put it in your furnace. You pour it into your various molds and you ruin it. Mm. Now it is completely useless. Mm. If you know anything about making iron and steel, it is not something that anybody can do. Mm. You've got to have the right temperatures. You have to have the right uh, ingredients. It's not just iron and steel. You've got, uh, you've got to have everything just right. And so at, after a year or so of this, China's production of steel increased 30% and virtually all of it was useless. Oh. <laughs> Nobody had pots and pans. Yeah, and so, and, and in addition to that, lots and lots of peasants have lost their tools and their pots and pans. So yeah, just one foolish thing after another. Uh, I, I have to say this before I forget, because I don't have a next week to say what I forgot this week. <laughs> um, there is a, a, a story that the doctor, Mao's doctor, was talking about. Uh, Mao had some abscesses in his mouth. His teeth were not very good because he never brushed his teeth. Because as a peasant, what you do, or at least what he did, was rinse his mouth with tea. So his teeth were very dark and he had abscesses. And so his doctor is trying to convince him you know, you really need to brush your teeth. And Mao said, oh, wait a second. Does a tiger ever brush his teeth? <laughs> Tiger's teeth are very sharp. Tigers never brush their teeth. So no, I don't need to brush my teeth. That's the kind of irrefutable logic that Mao had and he used against people all the time. And that's what he did to China. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, and again, the, uh, the farm, the collective farms are put together. People will live now in barracks. People will eat in dining halls. You do not have your own personal home anymore. So you don't need your pots and pans. Yeah, yeah, you don't need your pots and pans, right. <laughs> so here's, here's one of the years of the... So, the Great Leap Forward uh, started in 1957, 58, and, and went through 1962. So here's a picture of the backyard furnaces, just what everybody needs. And here's all the happy peasants working on the collective farm. So here's, here's another Part. I don't know if this was Mao in particular who came up with this genius plan of increasing production, but um, it's very simple. If you are a communist, how do you increase the production on any given farm? Well, first you dig the furrows deeper. I'm not really sure about the logic of that, but that's what they did. Dig the furrows deeper and then plant everything closer together, right? <laughs> you plant twice as much rice in the same field, what could go wrong? <laughs> you get twice as much output, right? Not only that, but you put twice as much fertilizer on it. <laughs> Simple mathematics. <laughs> you do all these steps and you get twice the production, right? <laughs> no, any idiot farmer would tell you that this is a disaster, and it was. So you have the Great Famine, 1959 to 1961. And as this was happening, as people across China began to starve to death in the villages and the larger cities in the countryside, Mao knew all about it. One of the things that I also learned from the doctor is that Mao always wanted to be informed of everything. Anytime he came into the room, to see Mao. Mao wanted to know who he has talked to and what they have said. And he did that with everybody. 
He read the reports from all around China. He was very well informed as to what was going on everywhere as much as he could. He wanted to know it. And he had a prodigious mind. He knew he was a very well-read person. He loved reading. So uh, he was not backward in that sense at all. And he knew what was going on. He knew people were dying. And uh, now, to a certain extent, it was hidden from him because people don't like to report bad news to map. So I should take that back a little bit, that uh, he was lied to quite a bit, even though he would tell people, look, I really want to know the truth. And everybody would look back and say, there's no way I'm telling you the truth. Because <laughs> they knew better. Um, so in addition to the disastrous methods that they used, uh, China was faced with a series of floods and droughts during this time, uh, which made it even worse. And, but the political cadres of the various villages and cities uh, made sure that the people, uh, just like in Soviet Russia, when they went through their famines, um, you do not steal the people's food. You do not hoard food for yourselves. And uh, yes, we will punish cannibalism too as you are dying and try to eat the dead around you. And so this is considered the greatest famine in world history. The, the numbers, of course, are all over the map. Um, I put up 30 to 40 million people. Uh, others will say the range is somewhere between 20 and 55 million. It's just impossible to know. Mao finally relented in 1961 and realized that it was a complete and utter failure and that could not be hidden from him anymore. And he felt humiliated, but he knew there was nothing he could do about it. So he relents and he says, okay, the peasants are now allowed to have individual plots kind of on the side to grow their own food and sell it. We still have our collective farms, which are the pride and joy of our country, but we, uh, we will allow a certain amount of land for uh, the farmers to grow their own crops. I assume he got married again since he has a son. Oh, you know, I, I, I haven't gotten into his, his marriages because, you know, time constraints. I will talk about his last wife, though, because she's an infamous character in herself. Yeah. So here's just some photos, the Great Famine. Um, the, I'm sure the worst of it just was never photographed. Imagine 40 million people dying. You know how many people live in Tennessee? There's, there's less than 7 million in Tennessee. Imagine everybody in Tennessee dying. Go from town to town, what do you see? Nothing but dead bodies. Just an incredible thing to consider. And if you were to travel the countryside in China at this time, whole villages, nothing but dead people. It just boggles the imagination. So I'm going to give a little bit on Mao's personal life that I got from uh, Dr. Lee, uh, he was very erratic in his schedule. He did not like having anyone uh, contain him inside of a schedule. But he was a workaholic, and he worked uh, very fervently in his cause. Uh, but it was never, there was never any consistency to it. Uh, part of it was uh, his, he could not sleep at night. He had terrible insomnia. And so he would be working through the night and sometimes sleeping in the day. Uh, he had his health problems, uh, constipated, poor dental hygiene, and insomnia, among other things uh, that this doctor had to help him out with. On the other hand, he was a great swimmer, and he loved to go swimming, even in 
very rough waters, which was uh, something that his entourage, the people who looked after him, his security detail, uh, was horrified by. Mm -hmm. Because everybody knows, if something happens to Mao, it's your neck on the line. Mm -hmm. So Mao was sort of paranoid, as most dictators are, not nearly as, dic as, as paranoid as Stalin. But his security detail was very paranoid because they knew that it was their neck. And if he went out into the ocean to go swimming, they were in a panic. Somebody get a boat, follow him. Who's the best swimmer out here? Get out there and make sure that he's okay. Um, oh shoot, I'm so far behind again. Okay. Um, he liked his girls and he had many of them brought to him. Um, the, uh, I, I really like the title of this, where they would get the girls. At first it was like work details. These girls are on some sort of work detail and uh, they're coming to see Mao. <laughs> um, the, once that was abolished, he had this uh, organization called uh, the Bureau of Confidential Matters. <laughs> And that's where he got his girls, from the Bureau of Confidential Matters. Um, okay, moving along. Uh, the Great Cultural Revolution. Oh, yeah. Mao, in 1962, was going to step down as head of state. Uh, he was done with the bureaucratic hassles that he had dealt with for so long. And so he was going to step down officially but not unofficially. Uh, what he still had going for him was that he knew how to whip up uh, enthusiasm among the crowd. His, his economic plans were a total failure, and he felt that deeply. But what he could do was whip up the crowds, and that was what he was going to do in his old age. So he encouraged people to root out cultural traitors. And you can define that any way you like. And he wanted the youth, especially, to take up this banner. And so across China, young people, grade school, high school age, become red guards. And they have their armbands and their uniforms. And they are told um, to take on the establishment and the old ways. And they're, uh, they basically uh, are told, yes, do this in the name of Mao. No one will be punished for it. You do as you like. Teachers and administrators of schools across China yeah. were taken out and beaten and killed in the streets. They burn books, destroy priceless cultural artifacts. Somewhere around a million people are killed. Millions more are tortured and imprisoned. Look at that. What a cute young girl, huh? Wow. These are the warriors, the cultural warriors, who are going to turn the world upside down. And they did. And here you have the evil uh, oppressors of the people taken out and uh, displayed. And this was going on throughout China. Every city, every village would gather up the enemies of the people and put them on display and beat them publicly. Now we come to Mao's fourth wife, Zhang Qing and the Gang of Four. She was an actress in her younger days. She's the fourth wife of Mao. The, the Communist Party did not like her, but she was a very charming woman, and she basically seduced Mao while she was, he was still married to his third wife. He divorced her against the party's wishes because they didn't trust her for anything. And she, he married this new woman and uh, she sets up this rival Ministry of Culture with Mao's permission. He wanted her to go for it, uh, to encourage uh, 
the, the new communist movement. What we need is, is enthusiasm. What we need is people to be more fervent in their beliefs in communism. Uh, so encourage student violence against school staff, and we're going to destroy the four olds, old customs, old culture, old habits, and old ideas. And as it turns out, old people too. And they were told explicitly, no one will be punished for what you do in the name of Mao. Now this was mainly from 1966 to 1968. The Cultural Revolution officially is from 1966 to the death of Mao in 1976. At its height, it was the worst with these red guards. It did, they did tone it down after 1968 so the people weren't being killed by the thousands in the streets. So here's Zhang Qing, and look at this poster. Here she is, the happy, wonderful Zhang Qing with her husband behind her. And once again, this enthusiasm is used by Mao to purge the party. His opponents, his rivals, the people he just doesn't happen to like, arrested, tortured, uh, brutally interrogated over long periods of time. Many of them commit suicide. They use sleep deprivation, 24-hour interrogations. They take turns. We have this team going for two hours on this guy. Then we switch out the next team and the next and the next. Um, the Red Guards, uh, in collusion with the police department, uh, borrow these enemies of the people so that they could display them out and beat them in the streets. And just like Stalin, Mao uh, attacks his inner circle. Lin Bao, who was going to be the successor to Mao, that's how close he was. He came under suspicion and he tried to escape. He tried to fly to Moscow, uh, but he cra crashed and uh, died that way. Uh, Peng Duhai, du yeah, he was brutally beaten, publicly hu humiliated for three years, 67 to 70. He was kept in a hospital and not given any uh, medical treatment and finally died in 1974. Liu Shaqui, Shaqui, was public, publicly humiliated, and this guy was retired. Mm. He wasn't even in the government, but Mao went after him, and he was beaten to death. Deng Xiaoping, his eventual successor, was denounced, publicly humiliated, sent to work in a tractor factory to uh, learn the ways of the ordinary people for four years. He was brought back and then denounced again just before Mao died. And here's the inner circle being humiliated. And the cult of Mao grows even worse. Everybody has the little red book of quotes from Mao. Every street has a quote from Mao, lots of quotes. Loudspeakers at all intersections quoting Mao. Every household has a large portrait of Mao. Trains, buses, public buildings, and almost every wall has sayings or pictures of Mao. And Western clothes are not allowed. Nobody's gonna wear blue jeans in China. You wear your Mao suit. And as a, another crazy thing that was going on, cats were killed by the millions because that's a Western pet. That's a bourgeoisie thing to own a cat. So okay. we're gonna kill them all. No cats to catch the sparrows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's there's catastrophe. Yeah. <laughs> the new cult of Mao. Yeah, really. Once again, Mao is the god that everybody must worship. Mao and the USSR. China received loans and technical assistance. He's begging for atomic technology, which he eventually got somewhat uh, late somewhat reluctantly, uh, both Stalin and Khrushchev uh, did not trust Mao, uh, but did give him, uh, somewhat reluctantly, the tools to make the atomic weapons. 
our re the relations with the Russians went sour eventually. The help was withdrawn. They had a mini war in 1969. How many of you remember that? There was uh, an outbreak of war on a smallish scale in 1969. Uh, and Mao was thinking maybe we need to go full, full on and attack the Soviet Union. He, he thought better of it. Uh, but this is where Mao says, maybe we should warm up to the United States. Mm. So we have ping pong di diplomacy. Mm. How many of you remember that? Oh, where yeah. the Americans go and play ping pong and Nixon gets the hint. Mm. China wants to open up. I can talk with Mao. And so Henry Kissinger goes over, has the negotiations. Richard Nixon arrives in 1972 and begins the process of formal recognition. And of course, one of those conditions is you must break off recognition of Taiwan because Taiwan in the United Nations was China uh, up until the 1970s. And then, of course, formal recognition was achieved in 1979. And there's Nixon and Mao. Yes? And the opera, uh, Nixon and China, showing live plays a very prominent role, kind of as a vice president to Mao. Uh, yeah. Where is he in all of this? So he is, Chow Lai is like the mouthpiece of Mao at this time. Mao is very declining in his health. He speaks with a thick slur. He does not walk very well. He is, in this picture, uh, Mao is sitting with Nixon. Nixon had one hour with Mao, and that was it right. on his trip. Mao was, was the idea, his, his mind was still sharp, by the way, but he knew he could not conduct lengthy negotiations, so Chow and Lai was the man uh, to do that. So we learned in Tibet that Zhou and Lai mitigated the cultural revolution to some degree when he could, to save some monastery and cultural edifices. Right, you know, right. So well, what, what are the... Also at Xi'an. Huh? Also at Xi'an, so the National Treasury Group safeguarded by the Zhou and Lai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the interesting things about uh, Barbara Tuchman's book, mm -hmm. Notes from China, mm -hmm. she says that everywhere she went, people are preserving their national treasures. But this was 1972. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, the height of the Cultural Revolution was 66 to 68. At that point, Mao kind of put the brakes on it. And so, in that process, from then to 1972, four years, they decided even though the Cultural Revolution was still officially going on and people were still being arrested for it, um, they decided they're going to preserve their national treasures. Okay, at 77, Mao is weak, slurred in his speech, uh, but he still has a very sharp mind. He had Lou Gehrig's disease, diagnosed in 1974, uh, at, at that point, his speech had to be deciphered by his personal aide because he was so he was slurring so badly, and he was living on liquid food. Uh, he actually met with Gerald Ford in 1975, and his mind was still sharp. Zhao and Lai died of cancer in January of 1976. He was supposed to be the uh, successor to Mao, and and he was a very popular person. And the outpouring of grief for Zhao and Lai really shocked Mao. And Mao didn't like it one little bit. <laughs> Nobody is to be worshiped but me. And so one of the reasons that Deng Xiaoping was denounced again was because he kind of encouraged that. Uh, but then Mao died September 9th, 1976, after a series of heart attacks. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, and everybody really in the uh, upper echelons of government were so fed up with Mao's oppressive uh, regime and especially his wife mm -hmm. that uh, they brought Deng back and put him in charge. He, he was not the successor. Mao chose a lesser uh, person, but he was very quickly uh, put to the side they arrested Mao's wife and the Gang of Four uh, in the early 80s 
She committed, she was actually sentenced to death, but that was commuted to life in prison. She committed suicide about 10 years later, 1990 or 91. So that is that. And I've gone way over. I didn't really think I would. <laughs> Any other questions or anything? Fascinating. All right. Well, Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question. What's next? What's next year? Next year? I'll tell you. Let me get this. Yeah.